of course, we have the famous Tel Dan inscription. Yeah. And, and the college did do the, oh, you, Abraham Biran was the- Wait, you guys person. found that? Yeah. The Tel Dan inscription? Yeah. We're that the ones who cool. excavated okay. Tel Dan. I didn't realize that. So that's on display today at the Israel Museum. Yes. And its that's importance right. is that it mentions the House of David yes. from a very early period at a time when some scholars had said David was a myth. He didn't really exist. So very interesting. Right. Tell, tell us who you are. Who I am. Yeah. So uh, I'm David Gilner, mm -hmm. and I'm librarian of the Clow Library here in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. and I'm director of the four-campus library system mm -hmm. of Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion, mm -hmm. libraries in New York, Los Angeles, Jerusalem, mm -hmm. and the main uh, scholarly library here in Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. um, and the Hebrew Union College, correct me if I'm wrong, is the main seminary of, of re the Reform Movement. Of reform, reform Judaism. Is I think correct? it likes to think of itself that okay. way. And it, <laughs> is there a competitor? Is there another? Uh... There are always little competitors. Okay, all right. But uh, certainly, <laughs> over the course of what's now uh, 141 years, yeah, the Hebrew Union wow. College has huh. produced reform rabbis mm -hmm. for North America mm -hmm. and some rabbis for South America. Wow and rabbis for Israel, mm -hmm. though uh, in more recent times, the reform rabbis mm -hmm. uh, who are uh, working in Israel are Israelis mm -hmm. who have been trained at an Israeli rabbinic program mm -hmm. of Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. Okay, so you're the head of the four libraries. In, there's one in Cincinnati, Jerusalem, New York, New York and, Los Angeles. and Los Angeles, and all Four of those are part of the Hebrew Union College Jewish Institute of Religion. Right. And you're the head of all those libraries. Okay, and how long have you had this job? Well, I've been director of the four libraries for 21 years. Wow. You said since 1995, right? Right. Yeah. And yeah. I've worked at the library mm -hmm. since 1978. Wow. I came to the college mm -hmm. in 1972 mm -hmm. as a PhD candidate in Biblical and Ancient Near Eastern Studies. Mm -hmm. I finished my exams and mm -hmm. some research towards my dissertation, yeah. but couldn't get a job okay. teaching. <laughs> so I went to the University of Illinois Library School mm -hmm. and then came back here to finish my dissertation mm -hmm. and a job opened um. in the library. And Wow. Here I am. So you've been head of this library since 1992, Two, and the head of all four libraries since 1995. Right. Okay, and, and you've agreed to meet with us here today and, and show us some of these manuscripts. Oh, manuscripts and printed books. Okay, so, so, oh, so you started telling me before. Yeah, that. people always ask, well, what's the oldest book in the library? That's, uh -huh. You've got a list of questions. Yeah, that's of that's course. everybody's list of questions. I'm sure that's on my list. And when they ask me that, yeah. uh, frequently I'll take, go in the back and get a cigar box <laughs> in which is a 4,000-year-old cuneiform tablet okay. <laughs> written in Sumerian okay. because we have a rather large collection of and department of ancient Near Eastern studies mm -hmm. where uh, students come mm -hmm. to study uh, Sumerian, Babylonian, uh, uh, and uh, other languages of the how ancient did, world. How did the Hebrew Union College in Cincinnati can you tell me how they got cuneiform documents that were written in what's today Iraq, ancient Babylon? Like, in other words, you didn't go and excavate a mound in, in Ohio. How did, how did they get these documents? Well, if you can answer. I understand there's some things that you're not allowed no, to answer. No, this one or... I, is easy to answer. Okay. What happens is this. In 1950, the president of Hebrew Union College, Nelson Glick, mm -hmm. who was a preeminent archaeologist in the Near East. Mm -hmm. He was a surface archaeologist and yeah. walked up and down the plains of Moab looking for things as well as uh, the other side of the Jordan River. Wait, for those who don't know, in other words, today he walked up and down what would today be called the Kingdom of Jordan. Right. And the other side of the river was what's today Israel, uh, including the West Bank. Right. Okay. And when he became president of Hebrew Union College, mm -hmm. He decided that Hebrew Union College should create a PhD program mm -hmm. that would teach not only ancient 
Near Eastern material, mm -hmm. but the whole realm of Jewish experience, literature, history, not just to Jews, but mm -hmm. to non-Jews. Yeah. Because if you were a priest or a minister and you wanted to study something about the Talmud or the Midrash mm -hmm. or codes or anything in the traditional realm of Jewish study, mm -hmm. there was no place for you to go. In codes, you mean legal, halakhic legal uh, The halakhic okay. legal codes. Yeah. And so he started a PhD program mm -hmm. uh, that was geared to non-Jews as well as Jews. Really? So are there non-Jews today who study at the Hebrew Union College? Um, I would say probably more than half of the PhD really? students are not Jewish. In yeah. I'm surprised to hear that. I wonder how many non-Christians are studying at Dallas Theological Seminary, well, which is a sense is the equivalent, I think. It's like the, one of the premier seminaries of, of, in the Christian world. That's very interesting. Wow. Okay. Well, I have a brother-in-law who teaches Hebrew scriptures at uh, Perkins School of Theology at Southern okay. Methodist. There you so, go. Uh, you right. know, it all depends. <laughs> um, he teaches, but would he be a... <laughs> would he study there? I don't know. Um, Maybe. Well, he's Christian, so it's oh, not a problem. Okay. Oh, so there you go. Uh, okay. So I have you know, a lot of people who I went to school with who are uh, ministers and, mm -hmm. or who are, are Catholic academics. Mm -hmm. I have a friend. Wow. I never know where he is until he sends me an email. Uh -huh. I'm in Japan this wow. year. Would you please send me And what something? does he do traveling around the world? He what teaches. His, he teaches, okay. And wow. uh, he, so he's a, a Christian who teaches, or he's a Catholic priest. Oh wow, who travels around teaching? And his he, name is Reinhard, and he studied here at Hebrew Union College. Yes, he got That's his PhD. Cool. All and right, I didn't. I was not aware. Yes, of Yes, I know. Okay. It's it's one of those little secrets. That's one of the secrets of the Hebrew Union College. And, okay. <laughs> uh, but now that yeah. we have, if you would, second and third generation students, uh -huh. we have a student here in the graduate program mm -hmm. who, at this year's graduation. Yeah. witnessed his father receive the Graduate Alumni Medal. Wow. Okay. So what happens mm -hmm. is, is that people got their degrees here, went off, yeah. say, to Asbury or to this seminary or that seminary, and then over time looked for students who they mm -hmm. felt could profit from the type of rigorous language based mm. teaching that we have here, we're far more interested in the text mm -hmm. than we are in theories of interpreting the text. Mm. So I love pe it. <laughs> people from conservative Christian backgrounds yeah. don't feel that they're going to be in any way challenged mm -hmm. on what we might call matters of faith. Mm -hmm. What's important is they can read and understand what the Bible says in Hebrew, mm -hmm. and in Greek, and in Aramaic. Okay. <laughs> and, in and, and, that's, and that's actually a really interesting point you're making. And look, I never went to a Christian seminary. I went to Hebrew University of Jerusalem, so I don't know. But my experience in dealing with, with um, people who come out of Christian seminaries is they spend a lot of time and energy on what they call systematic theology, working out whatever theology is all about. And the text is almost... Secondary, the text serves that purpose sometimes, but it's not the focus. Whereas Jews tend to be very text focused, and, um, and a lot of Jews, like I studied at Hebrew University of Jerusalem Bible, and we never even talked about theology. We talked about the text, which which I think is a very different sort of focus. I think in the, from the Jewish perspective. Though I, I have a master's degree in Old Testament from Emory University, mm -hmm. and though I took some courses that were sort of joint graduate and theology school, mm -hmm. the graduate courses were uh, mm -hmm. about text, text criticism, mm -hmm. uh, right, exactly. text interpretation, right. and uh, theology was not... Uh, an issue of graduate study. It was of mm -hmm. uh, a professional study, but not of mm -hmm. graduate study. I see. So people, uh, when I came here in 1972, let's see, I registered and took uh, a course in, in Introduction to Akkadian, the, mm -hmm. and then I also registered uh, for a course in Hittite. Hmm. And you read Hittite? 
Uh, well, oh, you're for, a little rusty. <laughs> fortunately, it's written in uh, old Middle Babylonian, so it was just <laughs> like reading the law of Hammurabi. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Um, but of course, it's an Indo-European language. It's, okay. It's, it's totally different. And uh, I took a course in Israelite institutions, social okay. institutions, marriage, slavery, land ownership, all of that, which is yeah. sort of where I ended up. I, I wrote my master's thesis on the status of women in the five books of Moses, okay. and I expanded that to a look at the status of women in biblical Israel. That's my mm. dissertation. Wow. And I also took a history seminar that went for four semesters on the mm. intertestamental period. Mm. But even that focused on text. We looked closely mm -hmm. at Ben Sirach, right. we looked closely. And you can derive theology from the text, and, and, and yeah, we, we did a little bit of that at Hebrew University of Jerusalem, you know, the idea of monotheism and the deutero Isaiah or something like that. But that's really secondary to the text itself, which is, which is the focus in, in, certainly in my studies, and um, very interesting. So tell us about these books. So we won't uh, uh, bring out the cuneiform tablet. Okay, no. And the, the, we'll the, the next thing that comes in yeah. line are, uh, you, I think many of you uh, listeners will have seen pictures of what we call ostraca, mm -hmm. uh, fragments of uh, pottery that mm -hmm. have writing on them. And you have those here. And we have a couple of ostraca, though yeah. uh, they're actually in Israel because okay. that's where we have the archaeology school. Okay. And are those Hebrew ostraca? Or yes, they're really? Hebrew ostraca and Paleo Hebrew. How did they get, where are those from? Well, those come from uh, places like um, Lachish, the most famous set oh, of okay. ostraca. Talk about the yeah. appeal by the uh, forces in Lachish. But was that excavated by the Hebrew and college? No, but okay. there are other places that people excavate. Arad, okay. for example, I think there okay. were some uh, they, ostraca. Right, there's the Lachish ostraca, the... And then there's individual ones. And just from odd ones yeah. that can be variously okay. acquired in the old city. I see. Whether they're legitimate or not is up and, to And by legitimate, you don't mean that they're not real. You mean maybe they weren't in a formal archaeological excavation. I mean, they're authentic. Well, they may be authentic and then they may uh, not be oh, authentic. Not be. It's okay. always hard to know. I see. If all of the oil lamps that are sold as authentic <laughs> were lined up, uh -huh. there would have been no night. <laughs> in ancient Israel. <laughs> in other words, there's a lot of fake antiquity sold in, in, uh, in, in, in the old city of Jerusalem is what you're talking about. Okay, interesting. Whether I, I wouldn't call them fake. Uh -huh. okay. I would call them very good replicas. Uh -huh. of... Well, it's, it's like the joke that you know in, in medieval Christianity, the most prized relic was, was a piece of the true cross. Yes. The one on which Jesus himself was crucified, and they say if you added up all the true the pieces of the true cross, it was, there was a forest. Yes, as, you know, basically you take any piece of wood and sell it as that. Okay, so, so and all right. of course we have the famous Tel Dan inscription. Yeah, and and the college did do the oh, you, Abraham Biran was the wait you guys person. found that yeah the Tel Dan inscription yeah we're that the ones who cool. excavated okay. Tel Dan. I didn't realize that. So that's on display today at the Israel Museum. Yes. And its importance is that it mentions the house of David yes. from a very early period at a time when some scholars had said David was a myth. He didn't really exist. So very interesting. Right. So, But that's this whole separate discussion. Tell us about the books you do have here. So uh, what we're going to look at, we have some also some fragments from the Geniza collection yeah. in Cairo. Are we going to get to see those? Well, we can. Okay. They we just must. tend to be somewhat unimpressive old pieces, single pieces yeah. and leaves of writing. Yeah. So we'll look at ones that are as old, mm -hmm. but a little bit more colorful and okay. comprehensible. Mm -hmm. Because you can look at a piece of writing, you can read the Hebrew, and you can scratch your head and say, I can read it, but what does it mean? <laughs> no, now I've got to bring up another movie reference. There's this great movie called The Frisco Kid. Right. About this <laughs> rabbi, he travels across America, and he's captured by Indians, and they take his Torah scroll. And the Indian leader says before his entire uh, tribe, he holds up the Torah, he says, I read this whole book. And he whispers to the rabbi, I didn't understand a single word. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so what, sometimes the Geniza fragments are like that. Okay. Yeah. But what we have here yeah. um, is yeah. not a complete, but uh, uh, an important piece mm -hmm. of an 11th century Masoretic Codex. 
So it's a codex because it's not a scroll. Right. It's a book with and I separately think my, bound my, leaves. So my listeners have heard of the Aleppo Codex and the Leningrad Codex. So this is, this is actually, um, you're saying this is from the 11th century? So this is the age of the Leningrad Codex, basically. Yes. It's from Leningrad Codex is 1005. This, this is about maybe 50 little, years later. Okay, wow. Okay, do we know where it was written? Um, we suppose it to be written in what we would today call Iraq. And the really? reason for this supposition yeah. is not uh, in some analysis of the handwriting, which could be from many places, okay. but from the art. So what I have here, this is within certainly 50 years of the earliest illuminated Hebrew can Bible. Can we move this out of the way so I can yeah. see? Yeah. And wow. here we have, this is the Song of the Sea. So this is from Iraq, from the 10th century. It's a Masoretic. 11th century. 11th century, sorry. A Masoretic And manuscript. by man Masoretic, I mean, here we go, mm -hmm. here's the Song of the Sea in Exodus 15. And the um, Moses Maimonides used how uh, the text was versified and spaced out uh, in his Codicology of Hebrew Manuscripts. And what we see here is something that looks like a traditional versification. And inserted are um, various sort of flower shapes and wow. bars with paisleys. And the scholars who know about these things, which mm -hmm. is not me, <laughs> Okay. Uh, say that this is an admixture of Byzantine and Persian art. So hmm. I assume the person who looked at the manuscript put his finger on Persia and put his finger on Constantinople and just where they came together uh -huh. was Iraq. Okay. <laughs> so it's, it's sort of a... a I would assume that there must be other exemplars on which to uh, base well, a possible. less humorous yeah. uh, story. Or he probably you know sees this motif in Persia right. and that one in Constantinople and or whatever. I mean, who and, knows? and may have so. seen uh, uh, examples in in, so, in Turkey, northern Syria, so the, so Iraq, let, like this. So this is very interesting. So, fifty years earlier, we have the Leningrad manuscript. And 75 years or so before that, we have the Aleppo Codex. And they have drawings in them, but not actually interspersed in the biblical They're text. They're at the back. At the back. The Masora, the text tradition, right. are on carpet pages right. that are illuminated. But again, there's no uh, representational art. Nothing, no mm. animals, no people right. uh, are not represented. Does but this have this, animals and people? No. But it okay. does have the uh, illustrative material interspersed right. so we have, in the text. You know, sort of flowers and geometric designs and like a rosetta uh, uh, pattern we have here. Right. So this is very interesting because it's interspersed in the text. And we don't have that in the Aleppo Codex of Lenin or Codex no. in, the, in the text of the Bible itself. This is a later so period. This is very interesting. Can I just look at this for a minute? A yeah. little closer. Wow. This is very, first of all, it's very beautiful. And of course, it's um, a Masoretic Codex, right. so it has the little the uh, Masarak Tana, the Masara yeah. Parwa, yeah. where with the footnotes, the right. little zero here tells right. you to look to the column for the text tradition note wow. that might tell us something about spelling yeah. or how frequently the word is used uh, in the text mm -hmm. or cautioning you that even though it looks misspelled, that's the way it's supposed to be spelled here. All the different things that the Masoretes used to control the transmission of the text and around the margins uh, yeah. uh, uh, and top and bottom is the Masaragadola, the um, more, more complete description of uh, aspects of the text. So, so it's, this is very interesting to me. So, um, so, and just for my, for my listeners here who can't see this, and I'm, tr I'm taking a photo here, guys. So basically what we have here in this Masoretic manuscript is four sets of symbols on the page. We have consonants, vowels, accents, and Masoretic notes. And in addition to that, there's a fifth characteristic here, which is these um, 
artistic designs, which is right. something you don't have on the, like I said, in the uh, Aleppo and the Leningrad Codex, at least not in the main body of the text. That's no. pretty cool. And because this was intended to be used, if you would, as a chumash. In other words, this was used for study, not for public reading of the Torah. It was read for study. The haftarah, the yeah. prophetic portion that goes with the shirato yam, mm -hmm. is shirat devorah. Okay. And so we have here Exodus 15, which is the Song of Moses. And the traditional prophets portion for that is Judges, is 5. Judges 5, the Song of Deborah. And yeah. it too is uh, oh. written out in this poetic... So is this a continuation of, of, um, well, the, of the, the same page? No, the Torah portion comes to an end. Yeah. And oh, so that's very interesting. So you have here the Torah portion, and immediately after the Torah portion, it says, Tiftar b'shoftim, um, read the... or well, No, it's the Haftarat... Haftarah b'shoftim, the, the Haftarah portion of Shoftim, or in Shoftim. Very right, interesting. Of, of to Parashah Shoftim, which yeah. starts wow. off with the uh, discussion of the uh, destruction of uh, uh, the Canaanites, and yeah. then goes into the song of, the song uh, of Deborah. Deborah and wow. Barak. That's very cool. That's very cool. So, oh wow, so this was, this was not intended to be a full Tanakh. No, we don't have the complete text of the yeah. whole Torah, but it was intended to be a uh, humash with haftarah. Whether, because we don't have the end, it also included the Chamesh Megilot as printed texts uh, came to do. I can't speak to that. Right. And but it has not touched oh, the text. Sorry, only sorry. The only the margins. Okay. I got yelled at for touching the text. All right. And we're not wearing white gloves. Tell us why we're not wearing white gloves. There are two schools. <laughs> yes. Some wear white gloves and some feel you should go wash your hands because if you wear the white gloves, you may end up bending and even tearing the corners when you go to turn the page. Wow. So what is the name of this manuscript? If, if I were to, you know, tell... Tell people, I saw that Hebrew, like, is this a known manuscript, the Hebrew yes. Union College? Manuscript one. This is manuscript one. This is manuscript this is H -U -C one. This is manuscript one right. at, at, of the and Masoretic text? Or? Keep your pen far oh, oh, oh. I was away. Write it here. It's like the czar, the blessing of the okay. czar. <laughs> Keep it far away. Okay, wow. This is absolutely beautiful. Now, can I get it? Can, can I get can a look at other parts? Actually, can you, you open like? it up? I don't want to get a picture of you. Um, well, let me, you want me to get the. Big book part? What's the big book? That's more of it. Oh, this is just a few. Okay. This is this is oh, just some pretty okay. pages. Oh, I didn't realize that. Okay. Yeah. I thought that's all you had. No. Okay. So we were just looking at some unbound pages. Right, that we acquired book. after oh. we acquired uh, uh, this the big bound oh. codex. And where did you acquire this, if I may? From ask? Uh, see, it's been partially and badly restored and mm. sought to be preserved. We acquired it from a private seller okay. uh, in uh, the 1920s. Wow. And it would appear here? it's a type of preservation oh. material. There have been several different types and some of, these are of gauze and it. Chinese oh, paper. No. And oh, uh, someday the donor will come that helps us restore this mm. uh, by taking it apart and putting it back together. So this reminds me of the Dead Sea Scrolls in the 1950s. They took scotch oh, tape I have, to take them in place. I have first edition <laughs> Bomberg Talmud fascicle yeah. of five minor tractates that the web, the worm holes yeah. and gouges were repaired with scotch tape. <sighs> it took me three years of Friday afternoons mm -hmm to gently remove the scotch tape. Wow. And then eight weeks over the summer for the grandson of one of our professors to use Q-tips and Goo Gone to get the last What's of Goo Gone? It, exactly, goo Gone, okay, it gets rid of goo. Right, wow. to get the last of the sticky off wow. the pages Ugh. so that at least it could be used yeah. in class to show people what early printed Talmud looked like. Mm, wow. Wow, that's that's so people so, meant well, but they caused damage. Okay. Yes. So they wow. used what was available at the time for their 
uh, preservation of the wow. original. We would call that conservation today. And the preservation would be saving the intellectual mm -hmm. content. And if you look very closely, you may find that some of the Haftarot, some of the prophetic readings at the end of, are slightly different than the ones we would expect to find today. But even though these readings were put down by um, rabbis early on, there were different traditions for what to read. Yes. Meaning like if you go to an Ashkenazic synagogue or a Sephardic synagogue, there'll be different traditions. You know, not for all of them, but for some of them. So, so here there's, there's a, a set of traditions that isn't Ashkenazic or Sephardic, is what you're saying? Well, what I'm like saying that's is... Like that's a unique tradition? No, it's, the, it's a tradition of the, of the locale and of the right. time, and we can find different traditions. Until very modern times, people had traditional readings inside the Torah mm -hmm. that were not in harmony yeah. with what you would find necessarily in an authoritative printed text. Mm. But in Lower Slobovia, we know to read this word. It's an ancient tradition that comes directly from now, Moses. Now let's slow down. What are you talking, are you talking about the way a certain word would be read? Or yes. are you talking about which sections to read? Which a way would a word would be read. Really? So what's, do you have an example of that? Or, I uh, would need to <laughs> con <laughs> consult Okay. A list of them. Yeah. All right. But uh, okay. we have the lists. Um, the most famous such list yeah. um, is the list put together of Kennecott and De Rossi, mm -hmm. that where they collated manuscripts in the 18th century. Hmm. And many of the differences that Kennecott and De Rossi mm -hmm. noted in manuscripts mm -hmm. are... They're already post Bomberg. They're after the printed okay. uh, Biblia Hebraica. And what they oftentimes reflect is a local custom. Okay. So they don't necessarily go back to an ancient reading tradition. Right. They, in fact, not necessarily. They definitely Unless don't. they're the ancient reading tradition of 37 years ago. All right. when, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Always a problem with the text. Okay. And there are little. The same sort of thing that we can see with um, uh, micrography. Like, here's right. a little parasha marker. And so this is Genesis. And if we come to the end of Genesis, we will find a very traditional Masoretic marking for the end of the book. This is Moses speaking with Pharaoh. So let me see if I can find one at the end of Genesis. I know there's one at the end of Exodus. No, uh, there's one at the end of Exodus where there's a bar that gives us the sikum psukim. The, uh, uh, this is already, we're in Leviticus. The sum of the, the verses. The sum of the verses. And those will offer include what the middle verse is, what the middle letter is, right. that sort of information. Okay. And uh, and what person? What? How much of the of the Torah do you have here in this? Just uh, I, I would think uh, less than half. Okay. But precious, if it was one leaf. For sure. So it was really good that we acquired these about thirty years ago. And those are in some respects better condition than yes. This. So. They had been separated, we think, from the person who sold us this oh. to sell us for the same price yeah. later. Oh, that's funny. Like the Sibylline Oracle. Got it. I don't uh, know about the Sibylline Oracles in that well, respect, but what's that story? The Sibyl yeah. brought prophecies of mm -hmm. the future of Rome to King Tarquin, uh, one of the last kings yeah. of Rome before they became a republic yeah. and demanded a huge price. Mm -hmm. And Tarquin said, you're ridiculous. That's, that's much too much money. So she took half of them and burned them. <laughs> and she, no, 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 don't do that. I, okay, how much do you want for yeah. the other half? Yeah. The same amount as I wanted for all of them. No, you're crazy. I'll never. She uh -huh. took half of them and burned them. Oh, wow. Finally, okay, okay, I'll pay you. Uh -huh. Give me what survives. 
Uh huh. I'd never heard that. That's yeah. a great story. Well, the, Wait, let's go. Let's go to the beginning, maybe of uh, Devarim. Here's Et Hanan. So let's see if we let's actually if we have, have the yeah. beginning of Devarim here. You know, you won't be surprised when I tell you. Oh, this is already Bar. Yeah, uh, uh, that I don't page through this too often. Okay, I can imagine. Yeah. We have. You saw oh, the. Oh, so can we see the Ten Commandments? We just passed it. I think. Okay. Hanan. We don't have to have uh, them. Well, that's true. No. Let's see. Because the Ten Commandments are written out in a broken fashion. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't be surprised if whoever had this manuscript that it might looted not be the Ten Commandments and, out and of it. Them. Also, and those pages might not be in order, is what we're also saying. So, so I just thought. Here's I'd an say. interesting thing whether it's a, a ktev or a kre, the tach panes. Tach panes, probably. And uh, in the margin, it's written the tach Pan Cheik. Tach Pan Ches. That's, um... It looks like a kuf to me. Okay. So, In, hold on a second. So here is... I guess we have much of the book of Isaiah and Jeremiah <laughs> here. <laughs> right. Here, this is the Shema, I think. Yeah. So where's Shema Yisrael? Or is that the second section of the It's the Shema? second section. Okay. So it's later on. So this may not be in order. Um, um, here, yes, you're right. There it is. There okay. it is. Uh, and you'll notice they, they broke the line here because someone must have seen that something was left out. But uh, uh, that, that so many verses uh, begin the same way. Ooh, this is beautiful. Yeah, so this that's is, interesting. This so, is the Ha'azinu. So uh, again, this, another one of the uh, versified portions. So specifically these poems where he adds the, the decorations. Right. It's not everywhere. No. Oh, okay. And, and maybe because you have these op extra open, sp open, spaces, open spaces, he wants to fill in the void with something beautiful. Wow. Is that gold? Has that been checked? Oh, yes. It's actual gold. Oh, leaf. but that, that you can hand hammer gold yeah. so thin that oh, so uh, 10,000 okay. sheets would be an inch thick. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So it's, so it's not the inherent tra no. value of the material. It's, it's no. the... Uh, and uh, uh, wow. here, uh, they, it's interesting, they included Haftarot for uh, holidays because here's the uh, Mincha for Yom Kippur. Oh, okay. Mincha to Kippur wow. from the Book of Jonah. And do we, has this been checked to see, like, are these Iraqi customs that, you know, which sections they read or, or is that... Like, why do they say this was made in Iraq? Oh, because of the art. Because of the art. Oh, and okay. because the... Um, Shapes of the letters match up with other texts that okay. they know from that period. In that All place, right. here's yeah. an interesting. Yeah, that's a creative. But it's it's an interesting creative. It's a completely different word. Yeah. Um, because what happens is this: the verb is tishgalena, the noun is shagal, uh -huh. the verb is shagal. Right. We find shagal appearing in some of the later works as Hamelech the Hashegal, the king and his consort. Mm -hmm. But the only two places where it appears is in a verb, mm -hmm. is here in Deuteronomy, mm -hmm. and in a book not written too much at a different time, mm -hmm. uh, the book of the prophet Habakkuk. Mm -hmm. It also uses the verb uh, uh, Shagal. Mm -hmm. In both cases, mm -hmm. it's corrected, and this is not a corrective, this is one of the... Um, it's a euphemism. Uh, yeah, but th this is the, uh, um, of the... Tikkun Esofrim. Um, Tikkun Esofrim. Okay, the scribal emendations. Uh, right, uh, where they've uh, <clears throat> amended Shagal to Shachav. I guess Shagal became too much of a slang phrase. And so it was impolite, mm -hmm. and they made it uh, uh, as shachav. And it's interesting because in this place in the Samaritan Pentateuch, uh, it also reads shachav. Really? Yes. That's interesting. So what we have is oh, a sort wow. of uniform change wow. among speakers of Hebrew That's in that place and time yeah. saying, oh, this is not a nice word. So, How can we read it in synagogue? So, so this is the word that in, in the Hebrew of the Torah means that 
to the, have the sexual sex relations with. Right. And they replaced it with, to, instead of to have sex with, to, to lay with. Right. And, but it's in the margin it says to lay with. In the body of the text it sa- still says to have sex with. And you're saying in the Samaritan text, there's nothing in the margin it just says to lay with. Right. That's interesting. Yes. So look, the, you know, I think most scholars would, I mean, every scholar would agree that the, he, the Jewish version is primary. The Samaritans might not agree. But um, I think, yeah, this is clear why they changed that. And it's very interesting. Wow. Uh, that also says something about when the Samaritan text probably was written. Um, or when this, that that actually, that that marginal note is very old is what it really means. That's very the marginal note is very old. That's the tikkun sofrim are thought to be very old. Yeah. Wow. Very interesting. Uh, and, this uh, is amazing. So this is one of, what, I don't know, 50 or 60 Masoretic manuscripts in the world. Yeah, I think there are about 50 like this. Wow. That's not that many. Meaning our... our our Hebrew Bible today, the authoritative source for it are these Masoretic manuscripts of which there's about 50 in the world, and you have one here at the Hebrew Union College. Right. Wow. And this is it. Right. And it's just not my field of mm-hmm. scholarly study, yeah. so I'm very happy to defer to others, yeah. you know, for what how they can use it. Yeah. I'm just happy to... Wow. Now, has this been like photographed and published? It's or? been digitized. It hasn't been published. Oh, okay. But we're hoping that someone wants to write an introduction okay. and will publish it. So when you say it's been digitized, so is it on your website? Or? No. Oh. It's, it's kept in the digital geniza. Okay. Waiting to go Which up. means what, your computer database here? <laughs> You know, it's it's on a, uh, a it's ten on, terabyte drive oh, okay. with other such things. I hope it's not just on one drive. I hope it's a backup. <laughs> Everything is okay. uh, 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 multiple independent okay. uh, arrays wow. of uh, data. Okay, very cool. So, wow, that's amazing. Now so that's a Masoretic manuscript. Uh, I will show you this because I show earlier showed you this mm-hmm. the. Um, Rothschild Miscellany, which is in a box binding. Mm-hmm. And I yeah. said only six Hebrew books have survived from mm-hmm. antiquity mm-hmm. in their box binding. Okay. And this is one of the six. This is one of the six. Yeah. Okay. This is known. And this is, and this is a replica here. This is actually the original this you're showing us. This is the us. original. This is an original one of six in the world. A Hebrew book's in a, in a box binding. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And this has the uh, uh, highfalutin descriptor of manuscript two. This is manuscript two but, of the Hebrew Union College. But okay. we all refer to it as the Ibn Musa Bible. Okay. After the scribe. Okay. And here it is in its box. And if you open it up, it opens up to something we call a carpet page. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. So this is the um, decoration at the front. Right. Okay. And okay. more decoration, just like we might see at the mm-hmm. back of the uh, uh, Leningrad. Oh, this is beautiful. So this isn't paper. This is what material is this? This is some sort of a leather. This is parchment. Okay. And does this part come down or no? Well, this is the clasp. No, but this piece doesn't come down? Uh, no. Like, how do you get to the bottom uh, of the book? I'll show you. Good question. Okay. We bring in diggers, volunteers from America, <laughs> and they spend the summer getting to the bottom. So what, when is this, uh, uh, this codex from? This uh, dates to 1500. Okay, it's relatively late. For, meaning it's, it's um, actually already after printing began. Yes. Wait a minute. And this is handwritten or is this a book? Oh, yes. This is handwritten. This is a handwritten printed. manuscript after printing began. Yes. I'll okay. show you other ones. Okay. Very interesting. And it's a it's really beautiful piece. Wow. And, of course, the, one, the pages more towards the center are even better condition. And you'll notice they just fold out of the box. Okay. Because somebody knew what they were doing. Yeah. Although, to be honest, it's hard to read in that crevice yes. there. Absolutely. How did they copy in that? Oh, they, they copied this before they bound it. Yes, they must of have. course. Absolutely. Because okay, you can't reach your pen in there. They had to have. Right. Before. Okay. And so we go through here, and there are the, at the end, there are the hafta wrote. Mm-hmm. So we're looking through that. So this is at the end of everything. At the end of everything, just like in your modern mm-hmm. 
go to synagogue Bible. Right. There's all the reading and all the and Haftarot to at the, the end, end. As opposed right? to what we saw before, where, where they were in each, right. each Torah portion. Right. Okay. So here's Yom Rishon Sol, Sukkot, and here the Shemini Atzeret, and Simchat Torah, etc., 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 etc. And now we have the Chamesh Megillot. Okay, the five scrolls. So here begins Kohelet. Um, Ecclesiastes. Because yeah. you need to read those in the synagogue mm. on Purim and Passover mm -hmm. and Shavuot and Tisha B'Av and Sukkot. Mm -hmm. So they belong in here too. Got it. And then we get to the end Right? And suddenly we find... Oh, this is the colophon. And this is the colophon. And oh, your um, uh, it's saying, I am Sa uh, Samuel the Little. Then... That was probably a common name, Samuel the Little. I guess so. Do you think he was really big, like Little John? I think so, absolutely. <laughs> and the, his shamus was Robin Hood. What can we say? <laughs> And he, he's the son of Rav Shmuel Hazakain. He's mm -hmm. a katan. His father, of course, is Hazakain. Uh -huh. uh, and then somebody must have, something must have happened. So this is either a secondary haftarah for Pinchas or there were some added leaves and somebody added this here. So it's not part of the original you're saying? Hard or? to know. Okay. Although, wait a minute. So this is, this last page is part of the box. And we get to the end, yeah. and just like the first page was mm -hmm. part of the box, oh, wow. there's a final carpet page. Take a picture of that, please. All right, wow. And this is, is quite beautiful. a beautiful that piece. That is a beautiful book. Yes, it is. Wow. Now, is this style of box books, is that more common in like for Christian books? or It was more common books, for or? books, but... They were mm, expensive bindings. Okay. And uh, like you say, only six survive in the world for Hebrew books. There, there must have been more. Are there? Oh, there were more. Are, are they common for like Latin books or, or well, Greek books? Well, they're or? certainly more common in the West. Okay. Okay. They're common in the West. Now you'll notice this wow. binding here. Yeah. It's. Um, I mean, this is a modern thing with It's perforated <laughs> tack, uh, 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 paper, uh -huh. uh, board, that's yeah. acid-free. Okay. And with the closures are made with uh, Velcro. Velcro. Yeah. And many years ago, mm -hmm. we had a visit from an important academic individual yeah. in an important Saudi Arabian university. Okay. <laughs> Brought over by the State Department. Yeah. And he looked at our library and he noticed that we had some students working, boxing manuscripts with this sort yeah. of uh, uh, make do system. You know, uh -huh. it's not very expensive to make these right. things. So this is like a jury rig sort and of And it protects, yeah. Yeah. protects them. And he, watched us make them and asked yeah. about this. And yeah. he said, this is wonderful. I have all sorts of old books uh, and we could do this. Yeah. And I said, of course you could. The next year, the State Department brought librarians from Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Jordan, Turkey, and strangely enough from Ukraine huh. to watch us do this. So this is something that you sort of developed yourself this sort of... Well, I think we probably read it in a how-you-do-it-good librarian. Okay, let me get a picture of this. Uh, a, a journal, like okay. the unabashed librarian, and said, gee, we can afford to do this. This okay. will protect our manuscripts. Okay. And we passed it on, and when the uh, these Muslim librarians came, we were very sure to put out uh, suitable halal treats, <laughs> and okay. uh, they brought it back, and hopefully it is being used to preserve uh -huh. material in Pakistan and Jordan and Saudi Arabia. I don't know what's being preserved in Ukraine, but uh, hmm. it's just what, wow. you know, happy to share uh, what yeah. we can share. We're not highly sophisticated, uh -huh. but because of that, uh, it reminds me of, um, I mean, I'm of course, self-flattering here, of quote from... Uh, Mark Twain, yeah. the great writer's works are like wine. 
Yeah. My works are like water. Everybody drinks water. <laughs> so okay. th there are great <laughs> library preservation laboratories, uh -huh. and we send things out uh -huh. uh, that need such uh, attention. Uh -huh. But just to add an added layer of protection, protection for, yeah, to something thing. like this, yeah. this will do for place. now. It's the money that we have. And then... Uh, frequently, uh, Torah scrolls would reach the end of their usable life, yeah. at which point one would put them away or mm -hmm. bury them. Mm -hmm. And uh, some congregations have chosen the put them away to give them to the uh, College Institute, mm -hmm. where they can be consulted for scholarly purposes. Mm. So okay. we can look at uh, different styles of scrolls and how they were written. And sometimes there are unusual letters that are written in the scroll yeah. that show different scribal traditions. Wow. Most of these were normatized in the late 16th and into the 17th century. But Tell us what you mean by normatized. The unusual letters, except mm. in some special communities mm -hmm. were all made to look the same. What are what do you mean by unusual letters? Give us an example of that. For example, like you mean like the large bet or the small vowel? No, those no. those okay. are uh, a, an ancient tradition followed in the West. Mm -hmm. They're not always that tradition is not always followed in the East. Okay, but for example, in Leviticus twenty, you will find. A pay, the letter pay, mm -hmm. which looks like a a kaf, uh, a um, if you would um, something with three sides to it and an open face, yeah. and a little line uh, from the top part coming down into the letter, mm -hmm. that this um, descender will have a curlicue. It will go round and round. Wow. Uh, so it has, and, so it's a pay with a little spirally. Yes, and okay. I can show and you. That's a, just in one place, or that, but in, in, in one specific place. Uh, that's the place that you frequently see oh, them, okay. and it's a, uh, a curlicue pay. Curlicue pay. Okay. And there are other such letters in Torah scrolls. Rabbi Kasher, in Volume Twenty Nine of his Torah Shlema Commentary, mm -hmm. has a whole book devoted to these, wow. more importantly, yeah. footnotes to uh -huh. other books which tell you where oh, they wow. can be found and oh, wow. what they mean. So okay. ever so often, mm -hmm. someone will send a question to the library, mm -hmm. look what we found in a Torah scroll, and, mm -hmm. and I'll be able to look those up in Rabbi okay. Kasher's book, wow. go to the source yeah. he took it from, yeah. uh, photocopy or scan a few pages, mm -hmm. and send them and say, here's the explanation by a cool. scholar. So I'm just going to pick one book here because I've got some other older ones to show. Okay. But this is the type of volume that was likely in a synagogue. Okay. So this is a Hebrew manuscript of, what do we have here, so of the Torah? 12th to 13th century. Oh, wow. And it's on parchment. Okay. And it's an incomplete text. It contains the weekly readings according to the Eastern Triennial Division. That's okay. That's, reading through oh, wow. the Torah in one third parts over a three year okay. period rather than. So, this the, is the three year cycle instead of what we commonly do today, the one year cycle. Right. Okay. And. C can I make a really interesting comment here? So, yes. So, the paper that's been added at the beginning is in worse shape than the original parchment. I think it, like this is not part of the original, right? This is part right. of the binding. That's so the paper of the binding is more depleted in some way than the original vellum of the uh, is that vellum, the original parchment or, right, or parchment. leather of the um, manuscript. That's pretty cool. Wow. Yes, it is. And this was clearly you'll notice it's yeah. set up um, the way you'd see in a, in a humash, in right. a printed humash. Right. So, so tell the listeners what you mean by that, how it's different. In other words, this isn't a Torah scroll. Is that the part you're getting at? Right, or? it's not a Torah scroll because what it has is 
it has the Hebrew text followed by the Aramaic Targum, oh, show me not the in a separate column, oh. but uh, oh, a written oh, following. So, Az Yashir Moshe is the beginning of yeah. the uh, A Song of the Sea. Right. So this is Exodus and, 15. Uh, and so, Az Yashir Moshe, uh, Bechein Shabach Moshe, Uvenei Yisrael. You, and here, so it now it oh, follows wow. in Aramaic. And so, this is the type of work that could have been used to study because it's tradition at the very least, mm -hmm. to study the weekly portion in Hebrew and in Aramaic. Yeah. But also, since at this time it's possible in the East that following upon each verse of the Torah, a maturgaman, a translator, would declaim the Aramaic Targum. Mm -hmm. to and I the think the Yemenite Jews may still do that. Or they did until recently. Until though. recently. In other words, they would read verses from the Torah and follow it by the Aramaic translation. And this must go back to a time when people spoke Aramaic. Presumably by the time this was written in the 13th, 12th, 13th century, they didn't speak Aramaic, right? Yes. Okay, so there, so there is, so they probably, the average Jew may have known the Hebrew better than he understood the translation. <laughs> well. <laughs> if he understood that. You know, I can, I can speak for my grandfather. Yeah. Uh, who was a pious Jew, a kosher butcher. Okay. And he would sit, and he would read the weekly portion, and he would read it in Hebrew, yeah. and he would read it in Aramaic, mm -hmm. but he, I think, best understood it uh -huh. from the Targum Yehoash, the translation into Yiddish. Oh. Now, he'd been doing this his whole life. So this is cool. He read it in Hebrew, Aramaic, and then Yiddish. Right. And Yiddish was his native language. Yes. Okay. Wow. That's Though he spoke some Russian and Polish and English, but... And he was... Where was he born? He was born in Ostarov, in Lumja Gaberna, in about 75 what miles is that east <laughs> and 20, about 25 or so miles north of Warsaw. Okay. So I guess it's in Poland today. Yeah. Of okay. course, it was part of the Russian Empire when right. he was born in the 1880s. Okay. Wow. That's interesting that he spoke some Russian and um, He did business Poland. with okay. the Russian army. Yeah. Uh, interesting. If the meat Very was not halakhically kosher, yeah. but nevertheless fit, yeah. he would sell it to the army. Right. So... so uh, was he what would be considered today orthodox? Oh, yes. Or, okay, that's interesting. You mentioned your grandfather was a, a shochet, a butch, kosher butcher. Was he a shochet or a oh, butcher? he was a shochet. So he was well a ritual slaughterer. This is a controversial topic I probably shouldn't ask. But I've heard this famous story related to this place where we are right now, or this institution, which is known in at least the conservative Jews call it the Trefa Banquet. Yes. Is that something you can talk about? Sure, why not? I find that a fascinating story, especially when you're grandfather was a shochet. And uh, on my mother's side, yeah. my great-great-grandfather was yeah. a sofer. Oh, wow. A so, scribe. Yes. Wow. A ritual, a ritual scribe. Or yes. back then where they... I mean, oh, back, yes. back he, then it was he, just for ritual He was... He, he... For ritual purposes. In other words, there was a time when a scribe... Everything that was written was written by a scribe. But then printing came along and scribes were only used for writing special documents, maybe like a marriage contract or something. Just so, or divorce, yeah. which had yeah. to be written out correctly. Okay. All right, excellent. So, so we just did this amazing series with this amazing information and manuscripts you showed me. And, um, and you mentioned after, I, it always happens after I turn off, turn off the recorder, you said, you know, people can come here. So, so is this open to the public, this, this facility? This facility is open to the public. And if you're a resident of the tri-state area, you can borrow any of the 300-odd thousand books in the public stacks. And what is the tri-state area for those um, around here? Northern Kentucky, eastern Indiana, southern Ohio. Mm -hmm. But uh, you're always welcome from wherever, uh, Timbuktu, oh. to uh, come and look at the material in the library. And now they can't come and take out Cairo Geniza fragments. But no, that's why I said the 325,000 <laughs> okay. in the open stacks. Okay. The Cairo Geniza fragments they can come and look at, mm -hmm. though because they're all available online on the Friedberg Geniza project, they could look at them in home. Right, right. So you, they can see those online. So, and, and we're sitting here in this room, which has a number of rare books. Can they make an appointment to come and see these rare books? Absolutely. Okay, and how would they contact you through the Hebrew Union College website? Uh, they can uh, contact the library. They're on the website, uh, there's uh, a contact 
form. And if there are people in, for example, Los Angeles or New York or even Jerusalem who want to um, have some interaction with the Hebrew Union College libraries, would they be able to go to the – are those open to the public? They can go and ask uh, to use the library. Mm-hmm. And it's open to the public to use those libraries? Um, the security in Los Angeles and New York and also sometimes in Jerusalem mm-hmm. is a little tougher than it is here. Oh, okay. But uh, they may be asked to produce uh, um, identification. Okay. Uh, we're a little bit uh, – because we're here in uh, God's own Eden in southern <laughs> Ohio, uh, uh-huh. uh, we tend to have a, 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 a smaller and I guess some people think less threatening group of visitors. Okay. Okay. What kind of visitors come in L.A.? That were I don't know, but okay, I know okay. that uh, uh, uh-huh. three weeks ago, the imam of the local mosque came and we gave him a tour. He had a wonderful time. Okay. Wonderful. There's a mosque right down the street. Yeah. All right. You mean he came here to – Yeah. Oh, okay. Had a great right. time. We, we talked and I right. showed him all sorts of Arabic materials, oh, a beautiful right. 13th century Quran. Oh, wow. You have a 13th century Quran here among the other things. Wow. That's amazing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Very, very cool. All right, thank you very much. You have been listening to Hebrew Voices with Nehemia Gordon. Thank you for supporting Nehemia's Makor Hebrew Foundation. Learn more at nehemiaswall.com.